there's such a, it's such an easy fix, but damn, we've made it so difficult. And if you're popping Rennie's, popping Gaviscon every like single day, bro or girl, <laughs> you need to chill. More than 40%. Everyone's focusing on neutralizing stomach acid, mm. but do you actually know the function of stomach acid? It's literally the barrier between the external world and your internal world. Actually, I never thought about that as like product placement. You know, oh, the way you look at things now. Placement. You're like, it's crazy. You know what's crazy, right? Is the like. Globalization has changed the way we look at food, right? Mm. Like you've got things like acai berry now becoming so popular in the UK. That has a different impact on your gut microbiome. Yeah. And as we kind of globalize, we're now finding that eating local is actually better for our gut and for our bodies. Well, there's some um, there's some research coming out very slowly, but that's kind of suggesting potentially that our <laughs> our body biome is um, like registers with our local environment. And so that's impacting how we're like literally interacting with our environment, what nutrients to expect, what, like how to optimize absorption of different things in, in our environment and how like that affects our stress mechanism and everything. It's so interesting. Someone said the other day as well, it was on one of the podcasts about honey, having honey from bees that are local to you because of the pollen and everything yeah so. yeah yeah to like help with the yeah. regulate the immune system and your susceptibility because of the gender bias with yeah. trees because you're pollen yeah because yeah, the pollen's like local yeah. to you where so many of us are like spending a fortune on food that's coming from really far away oh like new zealand honey because it's like the, the, the manuka honey from new zealand because mm. it's like the anti-inflammatory properties that's great but local honey is probably going to do you more yeah. of a benefit would actually this is a good digression to this conversation because today is about acid reflux. <laughs> I know, I know. How does honey and acid reflux? No, because the reason why I say this is because like changing in food is now such a major topic to do with how our body processes and breaks down food. Mm. That we've got these new types of food coming into the system, which does require the body a certain level of stomach acid to break it down and to absorb the nutrients of it. Yeah, so that's we're definitely. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely having trying to get an issue at. with like our diet and our lifestyle is definitely contributing to kind of increased well more people experiencing acid reflux or heartburn on a regular basis like I think if you're consuming tons of processed foods or um, oxidized fats or you're overweight or you're drinking a shit ton of caffeine or alcohol or you're smoking or all of these things that a lot of us are doing on a regular basis are contributing to um, this issue yeah and if you're popping Rennie's popping Gaviscon every like single day bro or oh, girl, <laughs> you need to chill because you are literally sending your stomach acid out of balance completely. Aaron, yeah. can you see if there's data on how many people in the UK take PPIs? Mm. There must be some data on this around Probably. somewhere. Do you think that they make like things like Rennie and stuff mint flavored so that you start to associate it like a mint or gum, which is something that people have the habit of taking regularly? <laughs> Because, like, I do feel like people, so many people I know pop Rennies like, like they would pop mints. Almost as if it's like a breath freshener. And, like, I feel like if you have Rennies with you all of the time, then, like, you really need to look into uh, your what's contributing to all of this stomach acid because that is not good. Because, go on. Proton pump inhibitors. Though. Yeah. So, uh, this was from 2022, um, almost 1.5 million prescriptions issued annually by primary care alone. And that's proton pump inhibitors. How many people are taking antacids? Because like people mm. will spend years and years and years on things like Rennie's and Gaviscon and antacids. More than 40% of us use them, 2.8 million people reach for the market of Rennie alone. More than 40%. Because that's, that's like, I feel like that's the prequel to PPIs. You know, like people will pop those for ages until eventually maybe they get on PPIs. Or maybe it's people 
completely different people on the PPIs. And so as a whole, there's even more. And worldwide, more than $10 billion is spent on fantastic. That, that's not surprising. And that's not just for mm. reflux as well, because we know that actually people that are prescribed PPIs, myself being one of them, I was prescribed them um, to protect my body against some of the other medications that I had to be on. And that's a really common use of PPIs as well. It, it's not just because someone has reflux. It's often they're prescribed because the other medications contribute to um issues in the stomach and so they need to give the ppi to reduce the stomach acid that's you know what that's crazy yeah like i you know you know what's actually a funny anecdotal story when i was younger i remember i must have been about 13 14 maybe and mum was um i was getting really bad acid and mum gave me an omeprazole capsule to take and which is a controversial story because she didn't know any better yeah she yeah, wasn't yeah, educated yeah, yeah. in house so she didn't know any better and so she gave it to me and I remember looking at it going, oh, oh what this helps and, you know, feeling the benefit of uh, low stomach acid or whatever it was. And I was also severely overweight. Mm. I was a chunky monkey. And <laughs> I'll say that, we'll say that with confidence. But do you know what the problem, <laughs> Say that with truth. <laughs> yeah, it's truth. But do you know what the problem is, right? It's like, I remember, I remember when I used to work at Tesco's, the, um, the security desk used to have packets of Rennies in the, in, in the, in the thing. And you could, go pop, you could go pop over. And if you needed a Rennie, like some of the people in the, in the store would need Rennies, right? You could go and ask them and they'd give you a, a Rennie from the little cabinet. It was so funny. And I remember, you know, because obviously I wasn't educated in the house. So I didn't know anything about it. And all a Rennie is, it's, it's bicarbonate. It's magnesium and calcium, calcium carbonated mm. um, in there. And it goes in it's and basically it's basically... chalk. Yeah, it's basically chalk and it neutralizes the stomach acid. Yeah, That's all yeah. it does. And the problem is Rennie everyone's thing. focusing on neutralizing stomach acid. Mm. But... Do you actually know the function of stomach acid? Um, this is a question. Like, yeah. do people actually understand the function of stomach no. acid? We, they it's think like histamine. It's, we see it as an issue. Yeah, because you you think that acid is meant to be like it being high. The whole point of stomach acid is is to break down the food in order for it allowed to be absorbed into the system and to prevent anything bad in the food from entering the system and poisoning your system. It's literally the barrier between the external world and your internal world because mm. it's it's that place it's the second stage of digestion so everything comes into your mouth and it's the barrier to prevent any of the pathogens and bacteria passing that place so that they're not getting into your gut mm. and also if you don't have enough stomach acid you can't break down protein or b12 or iron or magnesium or calcium sufficiently like it lit you literally need stomach acid to break those down and extract them from the food and get them ready for the next stage of digestion and helping them to be absorbed appropriately into the body. So if you don't have enough stomach acid, that ain't happening for you. And that's a really, really big issue down the line. But you know what I wanted to mention as well in terms of we talk about heartburn and reflux and stomach acid as in, oh, you're experiencing reflux because you have high stomach acid and you go to your doctor and you're like, listen, I'm popping Rennie's like there's no tomorrow. I can feel the burn. I'm really uncomfortable. And they say, oh, you have high stomach acid here, have a PPI. But they're not testing the pH of your stomach in most cases. And actually, we know that usually if you're getting symptoms of reflux, it's often because you have low stomach acid, not high stomach acid, because you need a certain level of stomach acid in order to stimulate your sphincter muscle, that muscle that kind of opens or closes to give access to from the esophagus into the stomach. Um, it's it needs stomach acid in order to signal to that to close because it's like, hey, we've reached that level. We're about to do our business. Let's close ourselves off to the esophagus. Um, but if you don't have enough stomach acid, that's not happening. So you can get little bits of stomach acid that's like splashing up and burning the bottom of your throat. So in most cases, what we're talking about as being too much acid is actually too little and by taking PPIs and, and acids, we're literally making the problem worse. 
It's okay though, as long as we have like Pepto Bismol and all like the Hollywood TV shows of people popping them <laughs> and we like get obsessed. Like, you know, actually. I never thought about that as like product placement. You know, oh, the way you look at things now and you're like, oh, that's total product placement. But Just back in the day. Pink oh. Yeah. You know, in Friends, yeah. where was yeah, it yeah. Ross that was like taking yeah. the. But whenever anyone says Pepto Bismol or anything, the, the first thing you think of, or. <laughs> Antacids is that perfect? So thing? true. That's so true. If you are getting acid reflux then and you're taking PPIs, did you know the research for PPIs showed that you shouldn't take it longer than 13 weeks? Mm -hmm. Just think about that factor, 13 weeks. I've met people in my 10 years, 11 years of doing this now that I had a chat recently. He, I did um, an event for... Um, a, like a HR company they asked me to like kind of like talk about vitamin D because we were a clinician because of my experience in it and I was talking about acid reflux and the guy actually reached out to me afterwards and he said to me I've been on PPIs for 20 years and then it gets worse right <laughs> make you actually not even worse but make it funnier there's a another chap that I'm working on another research project I'm working on at the moment now for another bit of research that we're doing on, 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 on daily and one of the researchers, well, he's actually the, the gatekeeper for the researchers. We were talking about iron and he said to me, he's been on PPIs for about 14 years and his iron levels are so low. He's on like prescription um, ferrous, is it fer uh, iron ferrous sulfate, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ferrous sulfate. And oh, the really, really high levels of iron that makes the issue even worse because if you have low stomach acid and then you're supplementing with even more iron. Yeah, and like, anyway. the funny thing is iron is... <laughs> Um, if you if you take iron on a regular basis and it's not broken down and digested properly, the research shows that if it sits in the intestines, it leaches and creates inflammation in the gut and leads to gut inflammation. Such an like, issue. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Are we? Why are we not like talking about the damage? of actually bringing stomach acid low? Mm -hmm. Like it's so scary that this this is like it's the information is there, but. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna trigger Tracy, but it's now being prescribed to kids, and so you're one thousand percent gonna trigger Tracy. And so yeah, I think I this is gonna be a separate conversation about acid reflux. Yeah, the whole idea of reflux in babies, like, <sighs> sorry, you've already triggered me, but I'll I'll hold back because we'll, we can we'll talk do, about we'll it separately. But like that, yeah. my world was opened up when because I wasn't aware of that at all until we had uh Rivi this idea of reflux in babies and prescribing a meprazole to babies but yeah let's talk about that separately because wait till I link the research wait till I link the research so anyway to go back to it PPIs for acid reflux there is more to acid reflux than the eye let's talk about histamine yeah. and let's talk about H. pylori now if you have acid reflux one thing that they do look at is h pylori now helicobacter pylori is an incredible incredible stomach bacteria it literally builds up in the stomach bacteria and it leads on to things like stomach ulcers but what's interesting about h pylori is it releases two things it's called a urease enzyme excreting bacteria and what urea does is that it divides uric acid into carbon dioxide and into ammonia and what ammonia does is it makes it literally alkalizes the stomach acid, which allows it to actually like it protects itself from the stomach acid, and that's what it uses like ammonium as it like uses it as a protective shield. And the reason why it does that is because H pylori releases histamine. Now, when you release histamine in your stomach, you have something called the histamine two receptor, and that histamine two receptor needs uh, histamine in order to increased stomach mm -hmm. acid and so what h pylori does so these are two separate topics by the way so which I'll, I'll split in a second that h pylori literally releases that histamine it triggers histamine 2 receptor which increases the stomach acid that basically reduces that viscosity and that was what allows the flagella to swim and then it's also producing that ammonium which has a protective shield and that's what allows it to line into the stomach lining now that histamine isn't bad but when the H. pylori is producing it, that could be the reason why you have acid reflux, hence why they do triple therapy. And by the way, the statistics on triple therapy is from the leases from the 1990s. 
And antibiotic resistance is going up and up and up and up. H. pylori is on one of the, it's on the top 20 list of anti antibiotic resistant, um, you know, uh, bacterias. And so histamine plays a major role in acid reflux. Mm. And well, often they give anti H2 um, antihistamines yeah. to, su uh, to support acid reflux. Which, once again, is another problem. Mm -hmm. So if you have H. pylori, you need to deal with this. Mm. And I'm not saying H. pylori is the root cause of acid reflux, well, but it plays a major role in it. Yeah, well, because I think I think they're two separate topics because mm. you can have, I think there's loads and loads of cases of acid reflux where H. pylori doesn't play a role. Yep. But for sure, if you do have H. pylori, then you got to get on it. But I symptomatic, would say that's like... Symptomatic H. pylori. Yeah, 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 you yeah. can test positive and have no symptoms. Mm. It's only if you've got symptomatic yeah, H. pylori. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't, yeah. don't start treating H. pylori yeah. if you're not symptomatic because there's different strains of H. pylori and only certain... I think like they say 50% of the world population have H. pylori, mm. but only around about 15%. And they say some of these numbers lower that actually have the different strains of it. Yeah. Well, that's why I kind of see like acid reflux as you know an issue in and of itself without progressing to anything near h pylori just from the simple fact of most people that are experiencing this are being told to take things that reduce the acid even further when it's already an issue of low acid and when you have that that low level of acid it's fundamentally breaking down the second stage of your digestive system. So you're not able to break down and process nutrients, very, very important nutrients the way you should be. But no one's looking at that. So when we have low levels of iron, as you mentioned, um, or if you're, you've low calcium or if you've low magnesium or whatever, we're not actually taking into consideration the second stage of digestion to see if that's a contributing factor. We're just kind of giving a supplement and saying goodbye, go on with yourself. And also when we're giving these PPIs or medications to people for either to protect from other medications that they're taking or just because of the experience of reflux, we're not considering how those can contribute to severe nutrient deficiencies. I mean, B12 deficiency is such a massive one. Happens all the time with PPIs. People go into severe B12 deficiency. And often the whole reason you're given a PPI is to protect against certain, you know, pain medications or whatever, which B12 is so important in the in that kind of whole nervous system. So it's just like it makes no sense. Um, but yeah, so I think it's if you're experiencing reflux or stomach acid, you definitely need to be considering these things. And you need to remember it's usually low acid, not high acid. Mm. And from my perspective you need to be looking at your histamine and your ammonium 100%. levels. If you're increasing your protein intake, because when protein degrades in the system, one of the things that it, a byproduct of protein is ammonia. Mm -hmm. If your ammonia levels are high, if your histamine levels are high, nine times out of 10, you're going to have acid reflux. Mm. And if you're getting reflux, you can use binders to literally mop up the histamine and mop up the ammonium. Because when you've Re balance those and you reduce them because it's not about just uh, reducing them it's about balancing them because your body needs histamine to function like mm -hmm. stop saying you know histamine isn't bad but once you balance them and you bring those levels down you literally support the liver and kidneys in able to literally break down that ammonium naturally and so doing things like drinking water on a regular basis will support that as well because it helps with when you actually piss out that urea which is what ammonium gets converted into through bicarbonate you're pissing it out what was needed for that mm. so it's such a there's such a, it's such an easy fix but damn we've made it so difficult well i think we just we confuse people i think we've made it very confusing and that's the best thing you can do to um continue you know along the path where we're going yeah um but what, just as you were talking about histamine as well, you know, the way we speak a lot about histamine and people that have histamine overload or histamine excess, I wonder if something else to consider when um, 
experiencing those issues, if you're taking a H2 antihistamine, that could be impacting your stomach acid, which could be impacting the breakdown of that digestive process, which could be impacting your micronutrient status and even your macronutrient status because of protein and then your gut health and then your immune system so there's like a whole other pathway we talk about the issue with kind of taking antihistamines long term in terms of blocking the histamine receptors and that pathway but actually there's a whole other pathway that they could be impacting through these digestive processes as well so you know I'm just putting the idea out there it's something to to consider yeah I mean this is a I think acid reflux is going to be a topic we're going to be talking talking about quite a bit now mm. and talking more about. And I think we'll start sharing a bit more of the research papers and mm. because I think to understand acid reflux and the things that we've done around it, we need to understand the research that's been done behind it. Definitely. And as we explain that research and go through it, it's going to be an eye-opener, I reckon. 100%. And by the way, mm. we're not necessarily talking about mechanical acid reflux here because in pregnancy or if you're significantly overweight, those can be kind of physical reasons that can kind of press the stomach and cause the experience of acid reflux. We're more so talking about, you know, acid reflux where maybe you don't see a clear cause um, and long term chronic acid reflux. Yeah. So, so yeah. I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be an interesting topic of conversation. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Let's do it. Thank you.